Hi, my name is Grant, and I consider it a tremendous honor and genuine privilege to get to be the pastor at Summit Church. Uh, together as a staff and as a church, we hope that this resource blesses you and that it's, it's supplemental. Um, we believe that uh, following Jesus is best done in the context of community uh, with a local body of believers. So if there's anything that we can do to help you uh, in that journey of getting connected to other people relationally, please let us know and we would love to, to walk that out with you. And uh, as we open the word, uh, we just pray that it would be encouraging and challenging to you today. I'd like us to, to travel the, the path of what's next this morning for us, okay? So uh, if you'll turn with me to Jonah chapter 5. You should have called, that, you should have called me on that a lot quicker. <laughs> I kid, but we, we do want to take a look at Jonah 2.0. And we want to hear what Jesus himself had to say about him. And so in order to do that, we're going to take a little trip forward through the mists of time to a place called Matthew 12, to a time known as what's next, what happens after, and, and what's been going on so far in Matthew 12 is an escalating rejection of Jesus by the Jewish religious leaders. It's just, it's just ongoing and it's just rolling up. And, and the flashpoint of all of this is it just basically goes down in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 13, where he says to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored just like the other one. So Jesus heals another guy. Just like he's been doing all along, healing people, caring for people, doing great works and signs, because that's who he was. But that's also who he is. There's, there's nothing new going on here. He still does it, okay? Uh, can I give you a little seminar on, on Summit Church and our connection to the Foursquare movement. How many of you did know that Summit is what we call a Foursquare church, or part of the Foursquare movement? How many have no idea what I'm talking about? You can be honest, yeah. We are part of a movement called the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. You can look it up and uh, all that. Very interesting. But our, our, our flagship verse for our denomination is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, where it simply says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's, that's who he is. So my suggestion is that you read the life of Jesus with a view to the here and now, not just looking at him as some kind of simple history, because he is, he is still working, okay? I just want to share with you his work, very evident in our own family. We have a grandson who, when he was very young, we didn't know what was going on. He was acting, stuff was happening to him, and our, our kids took him into their doctor, and uh, he was diagnosed with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, if you're a medical professional, you may know what that is. It's extremely rare, and it's extremely dangerous. And, 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 and I want to just share some of the coincidences that went along with this diagnosis along the way. Their local doctor in, in little Moses Lake, Washington, actually knew what was going on. She said, I think that's what this is. And, and, and so she said, I need, I'm going to make you an offer. But you need to get on a life flight, either to Spokane or to Seattle. It's your choice, whatever you want. And our kids said, well, we'll go ahead and go to Spokane because we have family there. So they life flighted them over here, and uh, uh, they, uh, they, they got here, and they met with this doctor. And it just so happens that their doctor here had just gotten approval for a study of AHUS and a trial for some medication. He wasn't in Seattle. He was here. And our guy was the youngest ever to receive this new medicine. And honestly, it was a little touch and go for a minute. 
Long story short, as I mentioned, there was a, a medication available. However, the cost was $10,000 a month. More prayer. <laughs> God provided. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he provided. And, and, and now we have a very high-energy foodie slash cribbage player in our family that doesn't slow down. And, and I know that there's a, a room full of stories this morning just like that. The, the point being that Jesus continues to work in and for people up until this very moment. This particular incident here that we're looking at brings the local religious leaders to their final boiling point. Because this healing happens on the Sabbath. And they, they don't abide that kind of activity in their world. You don't do work, you don't heal on the Sabbath. So the guy is beautifully healed and he's made whole, okay? And verse 14 is the eye opener for us. The Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. And with this verse, we see a whole new world of opposition against Jesus. Because it's no longer, I don't like that guy. Somebody should do something about that guy. When you say something like, well, let's make a plan to kill him. Well, that's a whole new level. And then after that, Jesus completely heals a demon-possessed guy who is blind and who can't even talk. He totally restores those functions to him. And the people are amazed, and they're starting to think, maybe this guy actually is the one. They're not totally sure about it yet, but they're starting to, to realize it makes more sense to them. And it's not what they expected, but their expectations are beginning to morph a little bit. The religious guys don't like that, and they need to put a stop to it, okay? But the best that they can come up with is verse 24. No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. And they just keep trying to come up with lame stuff to get the people to reject Jesus. Can I love you enough to be honest with you for just a second? <laughs> you can only keep coming up with lame stuff to reject Jesus for so long. <laughs> and, and, and most of you know that. I tried. Man, I tried. I tried all kinds of stuff, you know. And I looked here and I looked there. And I tried astral projection. And I would just like sit in my room. I'm in Hawaii. but I was in Milwaukee. <laughs> so they see this amazing and, and holy work of God and decide to tell everyone, well, that's, that, it's of the devil. That's of the devil. And you need to remember that all of the prophecies that they already know from the prophet Isaiah regarding their Messiah is standing right in front of them. And their knee-jerk reaction is, well, that's the devil. I mean, what level of hardness of heart have they reached to attribute a beautiful work of God to the devil? That's really shaky ground. So Jesus gives them a lengthy answer <coughs> in verses 25 through 37, and he really lights into them. And I'd love to take a deep dive into that, but we need to talk about Jonah so I don't get in trouble. The bottom line in all of this is that Jesus just says, if you're not with me, you're against me, okay? Removing any illusions of neutrality about him. And isn't that pretty much the state of culture right now? Neutrality regarding Jesus? I just hear so many and they'll say, well, he's okay. He was a great teacher. He's fine. I mean, Jesus is just all right with me. But I'm not really a Jesus freak. I'm not a weirdo about him. 
And when asked, most people have no problem holding to a belief in God or some power or the universe or spirituality. But, but that name? Jesus. Jesus. It, 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 it messes with our equilibrium, our spiritual equilibrium. And we get real uncomfortable really fast. And yet if you know him, if you walk with him, if you love him, what a game changer. I wish I, I, wish I, could, I could osmotically place in people the weightiness, the deep significance of knowing and loving him. Now, little time passes, and we arrive at our passage of the day, and these guys just keep pouring it on. Verse 38, one day, <clears throat> some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Now, here's the thing about signs. I think we've all asked for something in the way of a sign at one time or another. God, if you will just fill in the blank. I know I can believe, and certainly there are things we would love to see happen in our lives. But there are those times when the sign becomes more important than the sender, and the message more important than the messenger, and the gifts more important than the giver, and, and the provision more, more desirable than the provider. But here's the thing. There's a difference between seeking for a sign and seeking for an excuse. So, so, so what is their surface communication, okay? If you give us strong enough proof, we'll believe in you. But Jesus knew that nothing that he would do could cause their hard hearts to be moved. And they're demanding a sign of their choosing while rejecting the signs of God's choosing. Because we already know that they, they'll just find a loophole and a reason to cast more doubt on him. I mean, they already said he's an agent of Satan. By the way, this speaks a really hard thing to me. It's a difficult reminder that not every seeker is necessarily sincere. Not all who say that they are seeking God are fully genuine about it. And in this case, Jesus doesn't give them much wiggle room because they're not sincere. And so he responds. Verse 39, Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I'll give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. It's important for us to have some context here. This is happening in a time when Jesus is performing sign after sign after sign. And, and as I said earlier, it's not like he's never done anything before today. But what did they do with all of the stuff that he's been doing right in front of him? They attribute it to the devil. And Jesus just dives in. He goes, listen, you guys are just an evil and adulterous generation. Here's the thing. It can be easy to overestimate the power of miraculous signs to change the hearts of doubters and skeptics. But sometimes we can think that way. Lord, if, if, if you would just do a miracle, I think they'd believe. If you, if you would just do a, a really big thing for me, <clears throat> I'd never doubt you again. These guys saw it all. They saw everything. And what was their first reaction? What you've shown us so far has been from the devil. What's their second reaction? Well, why don't you show us another one? And Jesus is having none of it. But I would, I would remind us <clears throat> that over and over again in the Bible, when amazing signs or miracles are given, often people don't believe. 
And I don't think we should ignore one of the most prominent examples, the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. They, they've come out of Egypt, okay? All of the plagues are now behind them, okay? Water turned to blood. Then there's frogs everywhere. Then there's like a cloud of lice or gnats. Boils. Locusts. Someday I'll tell you how I swore for the very first time because of a June bug. (laughs) If you and I had been through all of the plagues of Egypt and come out of it unscathed, wouldn't we believe? They make it through the Red Sea. Wouldn't you believe after that? They had food fall from heaven. They had water given to them out of a rock. And then they made their way to Sinai where they saw thunder and lightning and clouds all representing the very presence of God. And we can't forget, they heard the very voice of God speak to the whole nation. I don't know about you, but I'd never sin again after that. They had all of that go on, and and just a few days later, they're all dancing around the golden calf, like the first burning man. And they're saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. (coughs) The point, it's not seeing miracles that changes a life. It's the work of God by faith in our life. And maybe I could give you a simple verse that I think communicates it so well. Pastor Nick actually reminded me of it this week. It's a favorite of mine. And if I could condense my heart for you, Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just taste and see that the Lord is good. We love him because he is good. Because he first loved us. I want to give you 25 reasons why I know the Lord is good. Okay? Six children who have married five spouses and have brought 13 grandchildren. But first and foremost, Debbie. And, and, I, and I, didn't, I was going to rattle off all of those names, but I remembered when, when my kids were growing up, when I, would, when I would teach, that if I mentioned their name on a Sunday morning, they would get a dollar. Listen, I'm the last person in the world that should ever been a husband or a father. There was nothing in the world to recommend me to marriage or to, or to parenthood. But God shed his grace on us. Can I exhort you this morning? Just taste and see. Just Just simply give him some proximity. I'm convinced that you will see that he's good. Now sometimes, sure, God works through miracles. But it can be too easy to overestimate the persuasive power of miracles. It it certainly didn't persuade these religious guys, did it? I love what Jesus says next. You want a sign? I'll give you one. The sign of the prophet Jonah. And I'm sure they're like, what? What what has that got to do with anything? The whole getting eaten by a fish thing. And Jesus explains it in verse 40. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of that huge fish. Now let's be honest. Have you and I ever really thought of Jonah in this way? Because here's the thing. Jonah gave his life to appease the wrath of God. 
it was in the storm. It was going to destroy the ship, all of the sailors on it. What did Jonah say? Give me over to the wrath of God. Put it on me, and you guys will be saved. So they threw him into the ocean, and instantly the storm stopped. In other words, Jonah took upon himself the wrath of God. But death did not hold him. After three days and three nights of imprisonment, he's alive and free. Now, isn't that just a fabulous image of Jesus in in a very unexpected place? And I feel like we need to, to think through something here. Verse 40 says that he was three days, three nights in the belly of the great fish. And Jesus relates it to the time that he will be in the tomb, three days and three nights. And I want to make certain that we understand the most fundamental part of all of this. The religious guys come to Jesus, they demand a sign, and he says, you want a sign? I'm your sign. You just failed to recognize me. Even the Ninevites recognize God's warning to Jonah. Verse 41, the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now, someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. What's interesting here is that Jesus is pushing back against this opposition. The religious leaders pushing him, speaking out against him. And what does he say? Does he say, I wish you guys would like me? Come on, can't we be friends? Let's just focus on what we have in common. Does he say anything like that? Not at all. When they pushed against him, Jesus pushed back. But please, hear me. I'm not saying that that's for us to do in our situations. But I have to say that it was important for Jesus to do. Because we all need to face something at some point, okay? And it's just this. Life or death rest on a person's decision regarding who Jesus is. I don't know how else to put it to you. Your life and your death completely rest on the decision that you make about Jesus. And people avoid dealing with that all day, every day. But not today. I want to read to you a quote I, I expect so many of you already know it. Such a classic quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher." He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. (laughs) Thank you. I didn't write it. (laughs) Listen, at the trial of Pilate, I mean, at the the trial of Jesus, Pilate gave the people uh, this choice, okay? I can execute a total criminal rebel named Barabbas, or I can execute Jesus. And the crowd chooses Jesus, And it's so fascinating because immediately Pilate asks this question that haunts us to this day. He says, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? It's your question today. It's my question today. 
You have to land somewhere. And when you land somewhere, what will you do with Jesus? What's the decision? Because it, 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 it morphs from being a simple minor debating point to being a destiny decision. And if you do decide to choose Jesus this morning, there are any number of people here to help you move into new and eternal life. So he pushes back strong here in verse 41. People of Nineveh will stand up against this generation and condemn it. Simply put, you guys have received a greater uh, light and a greater uh, uh, info than Jonah ever brought to Nineveh. And, and they repented. And they had a much smaller and dimmer light burning among them. So that your rejection, he says, of this greater light is inexcusable. Because we can think of several ministries in the way uh, of, of Jesus that was greater than Jonah. I mean, Jonah's kind of odd. <laughs> you ever read that book? But Jesus is greater than Jonah. He had a greater ministry. What did Jonah do? He preached the, the one message to the Ninevites, and that was it. Jesus preached for three years. Did Jonah do a single miracle? Jesus did repeated miracles and signs. And yet with all of that greater testimony, they rejected him with much less evidence. By the way, the Ninevites really responded to Jonah's preaching. It's such a great response. I, I, I love the passage describing the repentance of the Ninevites. You probably know that one of the ways that people would repent in that day was to clothe themselves in sackcloth, or we would call it basically burlap, like a big coffee bag. You remember Pastor Courtney walked us through all of this. And it's rough, and it's scratchy, and, 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 and you're basically saying, I'm going to make myself miserable for the purpose of reflecting my misery before God. Not going to wear my usual clothes with this rough, uncomfortable stuff. And the repentance of the Ninevites was such that it says they clothed their cows, their livestock with sackcloth. Now that's repentance. I'm, I'm imagining the milk that would come from that. Little shards of burlap in your cereal. You think Cap and Crunch devastates the roof of your mouth. <laughs> I mean, when you're leading your cows into repentance, that's the real thing. The point, Nineveh really repented. These religious guys did not. And so Jesus says, one greater than Jonah is here. I love the heart of Jesus for Jonah. All right, do you see this? The way he talks about him, I mean, this is pretty much the worst of God's prophets. And yet Jesus doesn't pigeonhole him by his worst moments. And he does the same thing for you and me. But how often do I reference people according to their worst moments? What a great example we see in Jonah. That God would choose to use a total misfit. Like me. Like you. How could I ever do other than to love and serve him? There are no other options. Now in verse 42, he'll actually say that one greater than Solomon is here. Israel's greatest king. That's pretty presumptuous. But it's well justified. So he tells them, you accuse me of being in league with Satan, but let me tell you, you guys are the ones in danger of the satanic. You're the ones camping out at the devil's doorstep. And, and, and we mustn't pass quickly over the sign itself. It's the whole crux of what's going on here, okay? Again, Jonah's experience pointed to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus 
is proof that Jesus is God's son and all that Jesus promised and proclaimed is true. So all who believe in his name will have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. Not only is this the only sign Jesus will give him, it's also the greatest of all possible signs. So with that said... I want to invite you to move with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of the most prolific, profound passages in all of the Bible. And we're going to learn exactly what Jesus is referring to when he talks about the sign of Jonah. And the Apostle Paul is going to, going to walk us through what is, what is most likely the most important news you'll ever hear. You ever thought about the idea that the best news you're ever going to hear came from a graveyard 2,000 years ago? And and that the news is that death has died, that it's been conquered through resurrection. And so this chapter is devoted entirely to the doctrine of resurrection. It's a lengthy, detailed chapter, 58 verses. Most of it talks about our future resurrection. So, So you should care about this chapter. It's your future. But all of that future is predicated first on another resurrection that's already taken place, that of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the heart of our message to the world. It's everything. It's it's the core of all Christianity. The resurrection is the guts of the gospel. And without it, none of the other truths would matter. And Christianity would be relegated to just one of many religions. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 1, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It's this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message that I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was uh, seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, I also saw him. Now, I understand it can be difficult to embrace a belief in resurrection. We know historically that the Greeks didn't believe in it. The Romans didn't believe in it. There was even a a, a part of of Judaism that didn't believe in it. They were called the Sadducees, complete materialists. And I would suppose the majority of culture these days doesn't believe either. But is it so hard to believe that the God who creates life in the first place can also resurrect it from the dead? And it's important enough, but Paul tells us, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In other words, you can't be saved, you can't be a true believer, and also deny the resurrection. It's part and parcel of the historic Christian gospel. And I would certainly direct this toward an apologetic or a defense of the doctrine, but I don't think that's our purpose this morning. If you want to pursue a a fascinating path of study, I would suggest you purchase a book entitled Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison. I want to simplify for us this morning and just declare to you the most life-changing truth you'll ever encounter. So let's break it down just a little bit. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. First thing is he died. He died for my sins. That's it. That's all. There's, There's nothing anywhere in any other religion or philosophy or system of thought that can even come remotely close to that profundity. No one else can claim anything like it. And it draws my ear and it draws my heart because nothing or no one has ever given me that kind of hope anywhere at any time. Now just very briefly, why did he die? Sin. What is sin? Very simply, the word sin means missing the mark. Okay? 
And, and it's just uh, like back in the days of yore, back in the medieval days when they had all the big fairs and they were jousting and they were things, and they had a game called Sinner. And they would put up a big hoop down there and, and the archers would all get together. And the idea was you had to get 10 arrows through the hoop. If you missed any of the arrows, you're a sinner. You have to buy Mountain Dew Code Red for everybody. And, uh, you know, like, first guy gets up and he's just like, just boom, 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 nine of them straight through. You know, the tenth one, he gets a little overconfident. He tries to, like, do it backwards and misses it. Oh, you're a sinner. Next guy gets up. He's a little shaky. Oh, he misses one. But then nine of them straight through. Sorry, you're a sinner. And then I get up. Arrows are flying everywhere, and people are pulling their kids off the street, and they're running, and they're screaming, and they're shouting. And I miss all 10 of them. But I'm no worse off than the other two. I'm still a sinner. Once you've missed the mark, you've missed the mark. And that's what that means. So anything in your life that separates you from the love of your Jesus, that's sin. And, and so many of us have been raised in a culture that, that is all about performance or non-performance. You don't smoke, drink, dance, kick dogs, chew, go with girls that do. None of them. You don't do nothing. And that's not the way it works. Because what is sin for you might not be sin for me and vice versa. Anything. And you know. And you know when it happens and you know what it is. And that's what Jesus died for. That's what he gave his life for. So the death of Jesus wasn't simply a good man dying as a martyr. There have been several of those over time. It was the purpose of God that he would send his sinless son to pay the death penalty for sin, all of humanity. So he died. And then he was buried. Again, Jesus pointing back to Jonah, referencing three days in the earth, a picture of his own death and burial. In the 60s, a guy named Hugh Schoenfield wrote a book entitled The Passover Plot in which he attempted to discredit the resurrection by saying that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just merely passed out. He fainted. They call it the swoon theory. And then when he was laid in the tomb, the, the, the stone was so cold it caused him to wake up. And then the disciples came and let him out. Or the disciples simply came and stole the body. And Paul says an essential element of the gospel is that Jesus was buried. In other words, he really did die. And when he was buried, some of Rome's finest guarded the tomb. And no handful of cowering Jewish fishermen was going to attack a Roman guard. He was buried. And then the third thing, he was raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus died for our sins. But death couldn't hold him. He broke down the door, walked away from death. So these three things are the essential elements of the gospel. He died, he was buried, he rose again. And then the passage goes on to document all of those who actually saw him after the resurrection for further proof. This is a big deal for you and for me to consider. Okay? Can we take a minute to personalize this? When I was 17, I was in the middle of, of considering relationship with Jesus, and I witnessed a very difficult and life-changing event that rocked my world. That was on a Sunday. That evening, we had church, and, and it was a, a church that was the kind where they would ask people at the end of the service to come forward, and they would say, uh, come to the front of the church. They would actually call it an altar, and you would come and you would pray, and there'd be people to pray for you there. And, I, and that evening, I knew. I mean, I just couldn't quick enough. And I went up, and I just cried like a child, and I gave my life, and I just said, if you can do something with this confused and lonely and rebellious life than I have, I will lay it in your hands. He did. And I've never been the same since. And I purposefully didn't dig into all of the science and apologetics of the resurrection because I felt like God wants us, you and me, to take a breath, to internalize all of this. Because there are some this morning for whom this resonates. 
Maybe like I was, you're in process right now. Maybe you've been a follower for a long time, but you find in this moment that Jesus is speaking something fresh and something profound to you in your heart. Because that that sense of awe that we experience of God is not only for the new or the uninitiated, as it were. It's for the veteran believer, believer as well. It's for those that have been walking with him a long time. I need it all the time. And there's just, there's this sense in your heart, today's my day. Today's my day. I just know there's a step I need to take. There's a decision to be made. I'm done looking for signs. I'm I'm ready to stop chasing after elusive proofs. I'm hearing him in my heart, and I know it. And I just don't want to run any longer. I don't want to be separated from the one who loves me so very much. I want all the sin and the fails and the mistakes of my life to be erased and to be washed away. But it's not just taking care of the stuff and the behavior issues. I want to actually know this Jesus like I have never known him before. I want the activity of forgiveness to create a path for me to the heart of Jesus himself. So you'll forgive me when I say, Here's your sign. Here's your link to abundant and eternal life. Simple sign of Jonah. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. Then he got up. He rose from death. He beat it. And and, and he's not just some kind of a link to eternal life and forgiveness. He is resurrection. He is life. He is forgiveness. And for you this morning, he's just a prayer away. Simply communicating to him that you get it. I get it. The eyes of your heart have been opened. And you find that you want to move into that place of his love and of his presence and of his grace. Would you make a point to take some time alone with him? If you, if you would like to make that decision today, would you tell somebody? Somebody that, that is with you today, somebody that brought you, somebody that invited you? There will be people standing up here after service, ready to pray with you and for you. And, and are available to you. Will you stand with me? Now may the Lord give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to comprehend the height and depth and width of his resurrection, to create in us clean hearts, to create in us the desire to recreate his love and his grace in others. God bless you, Summit. We love you. Have a great week in the Lord. As always, it is so good to worship with you all and to open up our Bibles together. I hope that this service was uplifting to you and that it gave you a space to hear from and encounter the Lord. If there is something from this service that is stirring in your heart and perhaps that is leading you to take a next step into the community here, I would encourage you to really lean into that. At Summit, we have many opportunities for you to get connected or to get more involved here. And maybe that looks like stepping into one of our community groups or taking further steps to getting baptized or serving in one of our ministry ministry expressions here on a Sunday or throughout the week. Whatever it looks like, we want you to be a part of what God is doing in and through our church. So that being said, you can go online and fill out a Connect card and you will be contacted by a member of our team this week. We believe that engaging in gospel community with others is vital to learning how to follow Jesus. If you are local to Spokane, I would just love to extend the invitation for you to come and join us here in person and to take a deeper dive into the community here. And if you love Summit, but you aren't local, we hope that these services are empowering to you to go forth and to bless others in a local church near you. If you want to go back to listen to today's message or a previous message, you can find those on our website or through the podcast app on your phone. As always, we really enjoy this time that we get to spend worshiping with you every week. We love you and we will see you soon.